your selfers. Well, we got a different one for you today. We are going to try a new technology here to look at engine timing in a different way without taking anything apart in the car. Now, I realize this is not in any way foreign to you guys on this channel because we have done this a number of times before. We have done where I have coordinated a spark event with relative compression so that we can look at ignition timing uh, without taking things apart and all that. Uh, also, I believe on the other channel, we have done cam and crank sensor correlations to look at proper timing with a timing belt or timing chain so that the cam and the crank timing are correct. So again, this is nothing new for you guys, being able to look at various timing aspects without taking the engine apart. However, the technology we have today, which of course, again, will be based off of the uh, gift from our great friend C5 Diag, who donated the Pico 4425 to the channel. We are once again going to be making the most of that thing using a new technology called a in-cylinder pressure transducer. Now, I am fully aware that many of you guys do not know what an in-cylinder pressure transducer is, and other of you guys do know what one is, and you are hopefully as excited as I am, because I feel like a kid in a candy store with $1,000. Um, well, $1,300 to be exact, because that thing was really expensive. But I think it's justified. So uh, I'm gonna quickly explain the background of why we are doing this, and then we will go ahead and get into using the transducer for the first time. I am so excited I have not used it yet, but I want to explain why we are doing this. So there are two reasons we are doing this. One of them, of course, I know the nature of this channel, and I realize if I start becoming, you know, like Scanner Dan or whatever, I'm going to lose my appeal. Not that there's anything wrong with him, but my audience cannot afford a $15,000 Varus and also not a $1,300 transducer for a, you know, $1,000 picoscope, right? I am well aware of that. But first of all, there is great educational value in this. You guys have learned that when I have used the scope in demonstrations before to show concepts such as ignition timing, things like that. Uh, over on Schrodinger's Box Quantum Mechanics, we're going to be using it to demonstrate uh, variable valve timing. We will also be showing gas direct injection and the different injection modes and the times of injection at the intake or at compression, things like that. Scope is hugely handy for all of that stuff. But I also have a little more selfish reason for getting this transducer, and that is I finally faced a car diagnostic that has me stumped, quite honestly. And not just me, but a lot of other people over two years. And I believe that this technology is going to salvage my reputation and let me make that diagnosis where no one else could once again. So real brief history here. Uh, I was um, contacted by some people who have a vehicle that for two years, over the two years, two dealerships, six, six, six shops, they have taken it to, nobody has been able to get their car to run right. They say it runs poorly and intermittently has hard starting problems. Um, the only thing that is universally agreed upon on this car, well, not universally agreed because some people didn't even know to go this far, but uh, mostly it is agreed this car has a rich condition that is fairly significant and perpetual. The car, um, the fuel trim on this car is barely able to compensate for it uh, with the fuel subtraction. And it, um, while it is just under where you would get a check engine light, it has received uh, the rich condition codes and also it has drivability problems. It clearly appears to be due to the rich condition. As you can imagine, this car has had the parts cannon fired ferociously at it with um, fuel pressure regulator, EVAP components, obviously ignition components, that goes without saying, everybody changes plugs and wires. Uh, EGR valve, uh, I, I, whatever, you name it, it's had it. The people finally found me, thought, well, this is the kind of guy we need to figure this out, and I could not figure it out. I checked everything, and of course, I have a video series that will be on Schrodinger's Box Quantum Mechanics walking through this, and it brings me to the point where I'm at now where I cannot find the cause of this rich condition, but, but I believe 
it's timing related. I, I'm not quite sure why. It's kind of more process of elimination. And also the fact that the variable valve timing, the cam crank, uh, everything, all lined up perfectly well. But I still believe there, there's something off with the timing, and I don't know quite what it is. This technology is the second reason why I purchased it, because I believe it is going to help me diagnose that car. But before I diagnose the car, I have to learn how to use the new tool, and I've never done it before. So let's get started and figure this out. All right, I have wanted one of these for a long time. This is a Picoscope WPS 500X kit, and it comes with all kinds of adapters for measuring fuel, for measuring intake, uh, and of course, what we're gonna do for measuring in-cylinder pressures. It comes with all kinds of adapters and things like that, uh, different, um, adapters for spark plug threads and all that and uh, of course the unit itself which I found uh, actually is battery operated and you have to charge it. It has an internal battery in it. Uh, also, it did not come with the engine model but I did buy this and I uh, used a Dremel tool to carve out a part of it so we can see better. We need to really have a good understanding of the cycles of the engine, very specific understanding with valve positions and things like that in order to understand the data we are going to get from our new transducer. And finally, we have a donor vehicle. This is Vicky's uh, 2013 or 2014 GMC Terrain, which fortunately for me has variable valve timing, which is going to be necessary for me to create variables so that I can make sure that I can detect differences with timing. Um, so that is uh, going to be the other thing that we need. Of course, to control the variable valve timing, we are going to need bi-directional scan tool. I could use auto ingenuity, but we're going to use our final thing. And that will be, of course, your guys' first look at the Autel MS909 that was provided to me by Autel in a partnership where I am helping them to generate some data. We talked about that in a previous video. We'll finally give you guys a look at this thing today. <laughs> I am so excited. All right, so I know this is like total overkill for what we normally do here. Again, do not panic. We are not going in this direction. We will very seldom do stuff like this. This is a special thing for training only. Obviously, typically what I would do on a car that I needed to check timing is I would have to do what you guys do, and I would have to take off the timing cover, and valve covers, things like that. Um, I am uh, not going to do that on this car because I've already spent too much damn time on it. It's time to upgrade technology, and that's what we're going to do. All right, let's begin by quickly reviewing for everybody to get on the same page the specifics of the four cycles in uh, internal combustion engine, and then we will take that information and the graph that we get, the data set, from the pressure transducer we'll be able to make more sense of. So let's go over to our model. All right, I realize that viewers of my channel are going to be pretty well familiar with this, but we just want to make sure everybody's on the same page here. So we have a little engine model here. We've got our piston. We've got an intake valve right there. There is also an exhaust valve in the back that you won't be able to see. Of course, we've got our rocker arms. This is an overhead cam design uh, with a distributor. Uh, let's see where we're at here. It looks like we may be on a uh, power stroke, I believe. Let's get up to... Uh... All right, there. So now we would be on the compression stroke so we know where we're at. All right, so let's get here. And what we're going to be on here, we will start off with the intake stroke. So with the intake stroke, if we watch our intake valve right here... Okay, so starting at the intake stroke where the air-fuel mixture is going to be drawn in, or only an air mixture sometimes on a GDI. Either way, the intake valve here is going to open as the piston pulls in the fresh air. See the intake valve opens there? And a little bit late there on the timing, I guess. Maybe we should use the scope on this thing. But uh, as you see, we bring in that air-fuel mixture. We are going to be at a vacuum in this. Important to know for the data that we're going to get. Now, once we come down to the bottom dead center, that intake valve is going to close. Of course, the exhaust valve is already closed this whole time. So now we have both valves, the intake valve just closed. Both valves are closed. Piston is moving upwards. 
in an upward direction, obviously compressing that air fuel mixture, we are going to have very high pressure in this and it is going to be increasing as that piston goes up. Now, just before the piston reaches top dead center, look what happened, our spark plug lit. Isn't that cool, by the way? So our spark plug lights just before top dead center. We need a little bit of time before the piston goes to top dead center because when the plug ignites that air fuel mix, it takes time for that combustion to occur and for that expansion of the gases to push the piston down. So because it takes just a fraction of a fraction of a second for that to happen, we need to start that reaction before the piston reaches top dead center. We very specifically time that so that by the time the piston reaches true top dead center, that full combustion can have maximum force at forcing that piston down. So now we're forcing that piston down. Of course, while forcing the piston down, the valves are closed and that explosion there, that combustion is forcing that piston down to the bottom. As the piston is going down to the bottom, we are of course losing more and more pressure uh, as we get down to the bottom. At the very, very bottom of the stroke, there will be a little bit of vacuum. And again, a little vacuum just like there was before with the intake stroke. So now we've exploded everything, we have to now push the exhaust gases out. So just before the piston gets to the very bottom, probably didn't see it here, but the exhaust valve is going to open. When that exhaust valve opens, we will of course start losing some of that vacuum. Just like with this syringe here, if I plug the end of the syringe, because valves are closed, and I pull that syringe, there's a lot of vacuum there that wants to suck the syringe back. But if I open up, my finger, well then we lose that vacuum. Just that brief amount of time that I lit off, you can hear it maybe, and I lose that vacuum, well that's still a matter of microseconds that we're going to be able to see that actual loss of vacuum again when that valve opens on our pressure transducer data. So now our exhaust valve is open, piston comes up, it's pushing those exhaust gases out and look what's happened. It's once again come to top dead center. So we've made one full rotation of the crankshaft. That's two times that we reach top dead center. The first time was on compression stroke and then the second time we reached top dead center was on the exhaust stroke. Since the piston came around a full circle top dead center to top dead center, we traveled 360 degrees on the crankshaft, a full circle, 360 degrees. However, we only went halfway around on the camshaft. So we only went 180 degrees on the camshaft. That's why the camshaft is now on the exhaust stroke instead of intake. So then we repeat the cycle all over again. All right, hopefully that was review for some of you guys, with the exception maybe with what the pressures and the vacuums are. Remember the pressure transducer is gonna measure both pressures and vacuums and graph that entire sequence that we just went through. And it's gonna to look totally different than it does with pistons and valves and things like that. So let's take a look at it. This, by the way, is something you can do without a picoscope, let me show you. To be able to practice with this and learn some of this stuff, um, I did it through Pico Automotive, the software here. And even if you do not have a device, I do not have a device hooked up here, that's okay. You can still get the software for free and you see it goes into a demo mode. Uh, you can go to automotive pressure transducers in cylinder. You see there's different ones. We're gonna do the running today and it will load up. Um, by the way, it goes to a web page, which is where I learned to do this, by the way. They do a pretty good job explaining it. They give you an example graph here of what you would expect. Now, it's very, very important to understand that this is just a demonstration. This is not what every car would look like. You would have this same pattern, but the timings may be different. So what we're looking at here is a sequence over and over and over again of those rotations that we saw with the engine model. 
And basically what we have is this is the top dead center compression right here. This is another top dead center compression right here. This, of course, would be a third top dead center compression again. So the same cylinder again and again. So from here to here, we're actually going to have two rotations of the crankshaft. And that's because we've got our intake stroke here. Notice the zero line right here for atmospheric pressure right there. So on the intake stroke, like I mentioned earlier, we're at vacuum. But then we start building up way past atmospheric pressure. This is PSI on the y-axis. So we can see that we are on a compression stroke here. There's our first top dead center of the piston at peak compression stroke. Then we've got our power stroke here. The piston's coming all the way down. Now it would look like, it would look like this is the bottom of the piston stroke. That is actually not true. What's happening here is the exhaust valve is opening, but the piston is still moving down. We're going to see that in just a second when I label this up. Then we've got our exhaust stroke here. We will have the peak of the exhaust stroke, probably around here. This would be our second top dead center position. So you see you can't measure top dead centers by the peaks. This is all about pressure and vacuum here. Then, of course, we start our intake stroke again, which is going to, of course, bring us into negative pressure. And then it starts all over again. So let's label this up a little more clear with some markings. All right, you'll have to forgive me. I, I did practice this quite a bit before I got my actual tool, but it is a little foreign to me. First of all, um, one of the things I want to do is I want to zoom in on just 720 degrees here, a little bit like that. Let's go in just a little bit tighter here. All right, I like that. That's pretty good. All right, what I'm going to do is bring a cursor and we're going to find our top dead center compression. Looks like right there. Yeah, right there. I like it. We're going to call that zero degrees. Now, we don't know exactly where top dead center on the exhaust is, but we do know where top dead center on the next cycle is. So we're going to bring in another cursor here at top dead center compression on the next go around. And we know that that would happen after two revolutions of the crankshaft. So that would be two 360 degree revolutions or 720 degrees. What I'm going to do now is we're going to divide this up into four partitions to represent each half rotation of the crankshaft. So this will be basically top dead center compression over here. This is bottom dead center after the power stroke right here. This will be top dead center of the exhaust stroke right here. It was actually a little bit earlier than I anticipated we see. 540 degrees, again, bottom dead center. That would be bottom dead center after the intake stroke. And then, of course, we go back to the compression stroke for 720 degrees total. Notice, as I mentioned earlier, the bottom of piston travel, bottom dead center after the power stroke, does not occur as it would appear on the graph here. Bottom dead center appears here. But we notice that there's been a change in the vacuum here. There's been a pressure change. Let's bring in a marker for atmospheric. And if we look here, right here, we're at like negative 30 thousandths PSI. That's pretty darn close to zero. So I'm going to go ahead and call that zero PSI. And there's our zero line right there. Anything below that line is going to be a vacuum event. Anything above that line is going to be a compression event. Well, strike that. Not a compression event, a higher pressure uh, atmosphere. So what is happening here then that this line here, the 180 degrees, is bottom of the piston. However, we've got a pressure change here. Well, let's follow along again. 
Here we are beginning our compression stroke. We're building up to the peak of compression stroke. Obviously, our spark would happen sometime around here, and I can put in a spark marker for the uh, spark advance prior to top dead center. Then we have our power stroke here. Power stroke is still happening, still happening, still happening. We have not reached the bottom, but right about here, while the piston is still traveling down, because it's bottomed here, while the piston is still traveling down, right at the point where we lose that vacuum, what must have happened is the valve, the exhaust valve, started to open. And it begins neutralizing that vacuum back to atmospheric pressure. So we start losing that vacuum while that piston is still going down because up at the top, that valve started to open. So we're seeing that return to atmospheric. And then after bottom dead center, what's happening is now the piston is starting to go back up to top dead center on the exhaust stroke. It's pushing that exhaust past that exhaust valve that by now is fully open. We see a little bit of turbulence here. The reason for that turbulence is because when the piston is pushing that exhaust out of the cylinder, remember the exhaust valves are a lot smaller than the intake valves, so not all the exhaust just pushes clean right out of the cylinder. Some of it doesn't go out of the exhaust valve hole and it misses that port and kind of swirls back around and has to still be pushed up again. So you're seeing the effects of that turbulence there. So now the piston is pushing up, pushing up, pushing up until top dead center on the exhaust. Now the piston is coming down for the intake stroke. Notice that as the piston starts coming down for the intake stroke, we start to develop more vacuum. Now there's a little bit of a valve overlap here and we would have to look up specifications for that overlap. But at some point here, we can see that the intake valve clearly is opening. Actually, we've got a little bit of the exhaust valve still open and the intake open at the same time. But obviously by this point down here, while the piston is still traveling down, sucking in that air fuel mixture, obviously we've got only our intake open and we are drawing in air. As we're drawing in that air and fuel mixture, or again in a GDI, depending on the situation, just the air, we are coming to bottom dead center of the piston stroke from the intake. Then we can see the piston is starting to move up Obviously at a point that intake valve must have closed because now both valves are closed and again we're building up that pressure on the compression. That's what's happening here. Now, how is this helpful? Well, the reason this is helpful is because we can see our valve opening and closing events relative to the piston positions, and there are actually normal specifications for this information. If an engine is not within those specifications for the degrees of advance or retardation after the piston position, then you know you have a valve timing issue or a valve closing or opening issue. Now, of course, on the car that I mentioned earlier, I had mentioned that I suspected there was some kind of timing issue. Uh, obviously, something where your valves are opening later or earlier uh, certainly would affect the compression, but the problem is, is that, that that is going to be consistent for all your cylinders, right? Um, at least on that bank, perhaps. And uh, I did not notice any, any kind of compression thing, but again, that may be something that would be undetectable depending on an issue with valve opening and closing timing. Um, especially when you're doing relative compression, by the way, because remember, that's going to be the same for all the cylinders, especially on that bank. So um, let's take a look at that a little more close. Your eyes kind of look at this and go, well, this must be the bottom of the piston uh, travel. No, this is 180 degrees. From here, 180 degrees would be top versus bottom. And what I'm interested in is the point at which it is obvious that that exhaust valve must have opened. Now remember, the exhaust valve opening isn't going to happen at the beginning 
of the loss of your vacuum, it's going to be when your vacuum stops. That's actually when it just must have cracked open because the piston didn't bottom out here. Piston's still coming down. So something must have changed to create that um, change in, in the pressure pattern where we're no longer drawing vacuum. So let's bring in uh, right at that point right there must be where that valve must have opened. So I'm going to bring that in here. And then I'm going to bring another marker and I'm going to put it here at the bottom dead center of the exhaust stroke, get it right there. And we can see that there is a delta right here of about 52 degrees. And the thing is, is that there will be a specification for that that we can look up. Or I don't have that kind of information as a do-it-yourselfer. Um, so I am more likely to have to look at another waveform for a known good. Where's a good place to find that? Probably Autel AccuFits, right? Um, but also I actually um, uh, happen to find one for the demonstration that we're going to do. But uh, we can see here that we can do measurements to see uh, whether we are within a specification or we can compare this to a known good. Either way, we can get an idea that our intake or exhaust timings are correct for that engine. That's the use of a pressure transducer. I don't know. I think it's cool, but now that I'm talking about it, I can see where a lot of you guys probably went on and watched uh, cute kitten videos or whatever. All right, once again, you can do everything that I did without owning a PicoScope or the transducer or anything. If you download the PicoScope software from PicoScope, it has demo modes where you can do everything I just did. I just did it in demo mode right there. So if you guys are interested in learning this, whether or not you have PicoScope, you guys can do that for free. So now that we've done our homework, and congratulations to you guys, that's the way we do things here. We don't go in blind. Uh, you guys did your homework. Uh, you got to do it in about, about a sixth the time that I did. But the bottom line is now when we hook up our transducer, we know exactly what we're looking for. We know how to make the settings on the scope so that we get the correct pattern and we'll know how to analyze the data. So let's go ahead and set up our PicoScope. All right, so what we're going to do is remove an ignition coil and a spark plug. All right, now take note that there is going to be a variable here and that is when we are on the power stroke well we're not really actually on a power stroke because we don't have a spark plug in here the transducer is going to take place of the spark plug so on that power stroke after the compression stroke and the spark plug would light and force that piston down well, this piston's not going to be forced down. This piston's just going to be carried down, pulled down by the crankshaft as a result of the other firing events. So we're not actually going to have a power stroke in this particular cylinder, but that's going to be okay. It doesn't change our valve timings. All right, my PicoScope came with a bunch of uh, different adapters for different spark plug threads. I believe this is the correct one. It seems to be. So we'll go ahead and we'll thread that in. These settings allow you to set uh, whether you want to be on a 0 to 100 PSI scale, uh, 0 to 250 scale, or a 0 to 500 scale, I think it is. Yeah, 0 to 500 it would go up to max. Uh, and the zoom is a way of filtering out background voltage so you can kind of get a, a better zero. For what we're doing, I think we can just use the 0 to 500 scale and then zoom in with the software. Uh, maybe we'll play with that a little bit if the graphs look too small and undetailed. We can play with some of these settings. Uh, it also has, you can put a hose on here, so if you're doing fuel measurements, you can press this button to release the fuel pressure and empty fuel out of the unit, and you can have a hose tied to that. And this, of course, is where the pressure uh, would be measured from, so we're going to connect that up. And this, of course, is the BNC port to connect to the Pico scope right there. All right, so we'll connect our guy up there. We now need to connect to the PicoScope. BNC connection right to the PicoScope hardware. Put that in the channel A of my PicoScope. 
Um, what to do with channel B? Well, let's take a look here. If I wanted to, there's a couple things I could do. I could go ahead and connect my coil up there as usual and then put a ground strap to the battery negative or to the chassis so we could get a spark. And I could have this back probed and of course look for the firing events and I could coordinate that with our compression stroke. I could do that if I want. Um, to be honest with you, to keep things simple, just because I'm learning this right now, and it also won't really provide any use, I'm not going to do that. The other thing, too, is to be honest with you, I'm a little bit nervous about having open spark um, near my equipment here and everything like that. If you guys remember on a recent video, I almost fried my new PicoScope on the first use uh, because of exactly such a thing. So I'm just going to keep it safe and we're only going to use one channel. But absolutely, I certainly could connect up and get an ignition signal as well as a reference. But uh, I honestly don't know what use that would be. All right, we're going to go back to our computer with my gear shifter mouse pad, of course. And let's zoom in on the screen. Okay, I'm going to reload PicoScope, this time with my PicoScope connected. It usually automatically detects it, and it did. It automatically detected it. And now we want to go ahead and set up. So um, I am not sure what scale to use here. Um, I'm guessing this is probably like an amp clamp, where it's going to probably be like no more than two volts. Um, no, wait a minute, hold on, no, um, we want pressure over here because I have a transducer. I paid a lot of money for that thing, I don't want volts, I, I want to see the actual pressure. The other nice thing I guess is now when I do a relative compression test, I can actually have the software calculate the actual cylinder pressures on relative compression as well. Um, how do I do that? I think, this, this is just demo stuff, I know that, I think if I go to tools, custom probes, there it is. Um, WPS500X range one, that would be it. And that does not change it. Um, wow, I actually don't know how you, how do you change that? Oh, yes, that's right, that's right. Uh, over here on channel A, we can pull down here and that will do it. Yes, now I remember. There it is, range one, there's our pressures. Okay, so we got that part done. Uh, let's see, we're on 200 PSI scale. I'm, um, I think the previous one was like 100 PSI, but we can always narrow down later. Um, boy, I never even paid attention what the divisions were. That seems really fast. Um, let's see, let's think about this. For engine cycling at um, idle, yeah, I'm thinking like between, um, like 100 and 200 milliseconds might be good. Uh, let's see, I want to make sure I get a good enough sample rate here. Uh, so let's go to the properties and look. Oh, that's way more than enough sample rate uh, right there at like three, uh, almost four million um, samples per second. That's going to give a very detailed picture here. I believe that that should do it. So, let's go ahead and start the engine. Oh man, I'm so excited. All right. Oh, look, not bad. Not a bad guess there. Not bad at all. Now, the engine sounds like crap. It has, of course, a dead miss on that cylinder, uh, whichever cylinder it was. Uh, looks like our 200 is perfect, actually. And uh, we should also, as you know, when engine RPM increases, the compression increases as we see the engines warming up, so it's slowing down, and we're seeing the resultant loss of the compression pressure there. That's perfectly normal. Wow, this looks really good. I believe we can uh, zoom in on our time frame a little better. Well, that's way too much. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, you can definitely hear the engine miss. Let's go ahead and stop that and turn the car off. All right, cool. It's kind of funny when I uh, first started using the scope, the settings, like I, I had no idea what to do and everything. But after you use a scope for like a year or so, uh, you actually get amazingly good at having sort of an intuition of what you need to set things at. So it's, it's really not luck that I, I set it up there. You, you actually get a pretty good uh, feel for that. We could have done a little bit better with the amplitude here, but uh, again, we're just doing demonstration and learning this. 
So let's do what we did before. Uh, first of all, I want to zoom in just on like a, a 720 cycle right there. And let's see how well we did here. Let's put that right there. I'm going to call that zero degrees. All right, we can uh, now partition our rulers out to uh, four segments. And let's bring in our right there. Looks perfect. So we're going to call him 720. That should automatically calculate our positions here. Okay, now right here, if you were really observant, you will notice that this is different. The bottom dead center location here is more into the exhaust stroke. Um, and actually what it is is the um, exhaust valve opening is earlier than it was in our example is actually the, the technical thing that happened here. And again, uh, the question is, is this normal or abnormal? Again, this is useless unless you have a good reference frame. Um, so let's really quickly take a look here. Um, what I did was I did save a normal here. This is a normal, a good known normal here. And we can see, look where your 180 line is. It's kind of after this first disturbance here. Totally different than what we saw on the demo from Pico. Uh, but we can look at our 180 line there. Same position that we're finding here. So we know that this is normal for this engine because we're comparing to a norm normal. If we wanted to do it another way, we could actually look up a specification and we can go to our bottom dead center here. And we can pull in uh, again. Um, it, it's hard to tell from this view, but let's zoom in. Uh, just more specifically here. Oh yeah, we're way off. Again, we want to go where we we no longer develop vacuum because at that point we know we started to crack that valve open. I'm going to say it's probably where's our lowest point. Um, it helps to bring in another reference, right? Right where the dotted line is going to touch. So it's about right here, I would say. Probably about there, we got, um, yeah, it looks like it touches right about there. Probably about 47.6 degrees or so. Again, we could look up a spec on that. And again, even that would be for the exhaust timing. If we back out, uh, we again have the same phenomenon over here. Uh, well, actually over here where we've got our measurements. Um, so we again would need to see when we've got a full opening after the top dead center exhaust stroke, so we got full opening. That looks to be right about here. And there will be a specification for that. It also looks to be about the same, actually, um, about, about 48 degrees there. Again, I'm not sure where you would get the specifications for this exactly. Uh, really, all I have access to is known goods. There is a little bit of uh, fuzziness here because we've got valve overlap right here, we have a definitive low point here relative to top dead center on the exhaust. We also have a definitive point here relative to the bottom dead center on the stroke. Also, we could do relative to the top dead center compression. You could measure it either way. But uh, we want to kind of pay attention where these intersections are. And now what we're going to do is we're going to do a variable. And we will induce that variable by changing the valve timing on, let's um, change it on the exhaust stroke so that we have an easier time seeing the difference. And uh, let's take a look at how it measures when we change the timing on the exhaust valves. All right, let's give you a first look here at the uh, MS909 here. Uh, look, it already identified the vehicle. How awesome is that? All right, I got to tell you, this is by far, in a way, the best scan tool I have ever used in my life, hands down, by far. And uh, we probably won't use a lot of this tool on this channel because, again, on this channel, we're not going to use bi-directional functionality a lot um, because uh, most do-it-yourselfers do not have that capability. But 
Uh, for something like this, the only other choice I would have would be to try to put voltage directly to the variable valve timing solenoids. They're not particularly easy to do on this particular model. On others, they are. Um, so uh, let's see, what do we want to do? I think we want to go to control unit, uh, engine control, um, active test, and here you get a lot of bi-directional things. There's camshaft position actuator, and um, oh crap, um, we want to do exhaust, but I don't know whether we put the transducer in bank one or bank two. I, I actually don't know, but I think from a previous video we did on this car, I think the front is bank two. I think it is. So we're going to do exhaust bank two. All right now I've got key on, engine off. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start the car. We'll check that our Pico scope is collecting data. Okay, Pico's doing good. So now we want to create a variable here. Uh, so let's go ahead and continue that. And it already has some kind of default setting. Oh, to zero, I guess. Uh, let's go ahead and increase our cam position a few degrees. All right, so that's 15 degrees right there. Let's see if we've got an effect. I'm going to go ahead and decrease a little bit, see if there's any change on our capture. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure there is. For sure there is. You saw it right there. Okay, and you're only allowed to do this for 30 seconds, so we're going to go ahead and stop our capture. Right, let's go back to uh, a frame where we clearly, I believe, had some difference. Oh, there it is right there. Oh, for sure. <laughs> for sure. This is where we changed our exhaust cam position for sure. Uh, don't remember exactly... Um, what position we did here, but we can see for sure that that um, exhaust valve clearly must be opening later than it did before uh, on the normal there. So our uh, change obviously can be measured through this method. Obviously also you probably heard on the camera that when I changed the position of that exhaust cam, the engine ran considerably worse by far. And this would be a validation that the reason it ran worse, and we're talking worse even with the dead misfire, uh, it still ran even worse than that after the exhaust cam position change. And uh, we would attribute that to the fact that now that exhaust valve appears to be opening later than it did uh, on the normal setting when it would be at idle. So uh, there you go. This would have been an identification of an issue with the valve timing on the engine in this particular capture had we not manually changed that position of the camshaft. How cool is that, huh? All right, well, I don't know about you guys, but for me, that is like so tremendously fun, I cannot even describe it. And I'm also super excited that this is going to help me give me new insights that I've never been able to have before to help diagnose that one car that's got me kind of losing sleep at night. So uh, there you have it, pretty good summary of the technology of in-cylinder pressure transduction. There are also other things that you can do with this tool as well, including fuel pressure measurements and things like that. Uh, you can do vacuum measurements, you can do exhaust pressure measurements. Um, oh my gosh, all kinds of other things that, uh, you know, maybe we'll play with in the future. But again, I, I don't want to change the direction of this channel. We need still to be able to do things with your DVOM, your test light, and um, just some ingenuity on how you're going to do things without this technology. That's what we do here. But um, yeah, I, was, I, I just couldn't help but show this off, I guess. All right, guys, thanks for watching. I hope you found this entertaining. We'll see you next time.